Hi everyone, welcome to my talk, Empowering Teams in Your Organization to Self-Service Their Airflow Needs. So a little filler, a little about me section first. First of all, my name is Spencer Tollefson. I'm the data engineering, uh, I'm, I'm a data engineering team lead, a company called Kobo. I just want to let you all know that this is my first time giving a talk at a conference. So thank you all for being my test subjects. Not sure if it's going to be good or bad for you, but I really appreciate you guys coming out. Yeah, let's see, so a little about me, I'm originally from the States, but I now live in Calgary, Canada. And like I said, I'm, the data, I'm a data engineering team lead at Rakuten Kobo. I will refer to Kobo a bit more through this talk, as I'm going to talk a little bit how we do things with Airflow, and I might just refer to us as Kobo for short. We're an e-book company, if you didn't know that. We were originally founded in Toronto, Canada, about 12 years ago, and we were now acquired by the larger company, Rakuten. We're a commerce company. We sell ebooks, audiobooks, and like ebook e reader devices to customers. I've been with Kobo for about two years, and in my time, I'm going to sh because or over that time, we've changed how we use Airflow, and I want to share how, as a data engineering team, which I'm a part of, we have kind of streamlined and broken off pieces of ownership around things with Airflow. You can more or less think of this perhaps as the tips and tricks for different teams using Airflow, and I want to share that with you. So let's, I'm going to go over a quick agenda of what I'm going to cover in my talk. So first, I kind of want to lay out like the use case in my organization of how multiple teams share, share an Airflow environment. This is how we do it right now at Kobo. I'm going to kind of share that with you. And I just want to point out this means multiple teams having one Airflow environment. I'll talk a little bit more about multi-tenancy, but that's not something we're doing right now. And then, like I said, we're kind of going to do a bit of, I'm going to do a little bit of tips and tricks and just kind of share some of the core areas that, that we have purposely set up at our org. This includes delineating responsibilities when it comes to different teams around Airflow, building guardrails or training wheels for new Airflow developers at the company, how we set up alerts and monitoring in a team-based fashion, how we codify access control based on team assignment. This is important, they're all important, but do a little more into access control and which teams, people on which teams have access to what. And then at our company, we, the, I'm, on the data, I'm a representative of the data engineering team, but we have an operations team and they have their own set of responsibilities, and so I want to share that as well. Real quick, what this talk is, this is a talk about, it's a sharing of how teams at Kobo use Airflow mostly successfully. This isn't necessarily the best way or the most up-to-date way of having multiple teams use Airflow, but this is how we do it and it works for us. These processes have come together over time and as the business needs have evolved, this talk will hopefully give you some idea of how teams at your org can interact with each other in the context of Airflow. What this talk won't cover, like I just mentioned, multi-tenancy. I've even been talking to some people today about multi-tenancy, and it's very exciting, and I think there might be some stuff right on the corner that I will definitely be looking into once it's released, but I just want to point out that for the purpose of this talk, this is my org just using one Airflow environment among multiple teams. All right. Let me lay out a bit of kind of what it looks like for us. So this use case sharing multiple teams with Airflow. So we have our data engineering team. That's me and my team. We know Airflow pretty well. Perhaps we're responsible for maintaining Airflow, knowing how it works, getting into the details of it, that kind of thing. We do have an operations team. They're no less important than us, but in this flow chart, there's a little off to the side. They're responsible for setting up the infrastructure that our Airflow is hosted on. So we have a K K Kubernetes hosted infrastructure out using on-prem machines. Very good chance for you it's something else. Perhaps you're using a managed cloud service or some other way you're putting it together. This is what we do. And then we have, so we have Airflow, but what's the point of it? It's for business use cases. And so we've got a bunch of business teams that are interested in us even having this orchestrating, this wonderful orchestrating tool. So perhaps we have, you have a data science team and they want data and delivered in a certain way in certain formats on a schedule. Maybe the finance team, they want some sort of monthly or weekly finance reports. You could have a marketing team, they want to know how their campaigns are going, how they're comparing year to year. Maybe you have a customer support team, they want to know some of their metrics of how they're helping out customers. They're all interested in Airflow at Kobo and the one thing, there's a couple of things these teams all have in common at Kobo. One is all these business teams have some sort of developer on it. They have someone who knows how to write some Python. They have someone who can write some Airflow code. It's important to point out because they aren't fully dependent on us on data engineering to, for example, write their Airflow DAGs for them. 
However, these developers are not Airflow experts. It's not something they're looking at every day. Maybe they need a DAG and they get it up and going and then they come back for the next DAG in six months or something like that. Maybe only when the, their DAGs fail. They, but my, my point is that these guys aren't, these developers are not experts of Airflow, but, but they can interact with it and, and write it. And I want to point out these developers are the experts of their domains. Of course, us, me being in data engineering or people on the operation team, we don't know their domains. So that's kind of the layout. Now my first kind of slide about how we empower them is how we delineate responsibilities between the data engineers and these business developers. We'll start with the developers know the business logic, as I just said. And the data engineers know Airflow. We're more or less the in-house experts at our organization on Airflow. Perhaps we even do things like go to Airflow conferences and maybe occasionally give talks at them. That's what the data engineers do. The developers, however, this is an important point, they mostly author the Airflow DAG code. So even though I know how to write Airflow DAGs, and I could, we must have the developers that are ones doing it. However, they're not doing it alone. We have a, lot, a strong system of pair programming between the data engineers and the business developers. I still think that you know, pair programming is a tried and true knowledge transfer practice. It's a way for us data engineers who know a lot of the ins and outs of Airflow to share that with developers and we make heavy use of that. Once a, some code is written for a new DAG or for modifying a DAG, something like that, we also delineate the code review responsibilities. So data engineers, we should be looking for things that have to do with airflow best practices, optimization, does the DAG make sense, does the flow make sense, are you using, should you use some new features that have come out, that kind of thing. The business developers, again, being the domain experts, they should know the ultimate purpose of the DAG. Why is it even there? They should know the business logic. Perhaps it's a SQL heavy DAG. They should be understanding what the SQL is even trying to do, for example. And of course, their shared responsibilities should know what different systems are being affected, different databases, database tables, API services, whatever it is. Code should be clean. Everyone wants that. Some things, like the, some DAG parameters, for example, like scheduling, you know, no, this can be a shared responsibility. Is the DAG, is it, is it an event-driven data set scheduled DAG, or is it based on a certain schedule? Why is the schedule set? What should it be set for? Those kind of things are, again, where a conversation can be had between the data engineers and the business developers. And then last one, there's dependencies, knowing if the DAG is, you know, uh, the code being touched, is it upstream or downstream of other DAGs? How does that all um, interact? These are things that both sides should be talking about. All right, next topic, building guardrails for new Airflow developers. So one is us data engineers, I would suggest having a really good readme document or a really good documentation in general. It goes a long way. I think you hear it over and over at this conference that documentation is key. In my team, we've spent a lot of time getting a kind of a comprehensive using Airflow at Kobo readme document up, has links to all sorts of places. Yes, people often don't read documentation, but you can point them to it and tell them you can, when they come to you and ask for answers, you can tell them to go read it. I strongly suggest that. Have some example DAGs, whether that's examples you make for, like you call it example A, or whether it's just uh, some prod DAG that's really well documented, commented and clear for these business teams to go look at. I would suggest presenting and enforcing code linters and formatters. So this is something we've spent a lot of time on a couple years ago in my org to really make it writing code easy. So we, to be explicit, we use a tool called pre-commit, which is really cool. It's basically a way to um, make developers, it's kind of like giving developers the option to run CI CD on their code before they even push it to a, a Git repository. We've set it up with some basic Python linters for our SQL code, some SQL linters, and also, as well as some Airflow specific stuff. You know, it's looking for certain parameters are set in Airflow DAGs. And then of course having on this same topic, but actually having CI CD in the cloud. So, or in, in, in the GitHub or what repository. So that when someone's making a PR, you know, syntax and formatting is all taken care of there. That shouldn't be something spent on code reviews. Or by humans spending time doing when it can be done automatically. All right, a couple more things. Again, in our use case and how we have Airflow set up, we've also spun up a really easy to spin up, or we've created a really easy to spin up Docker environment for developers. So we, we can have our developers in a couple minutes spin up a Docker environment. That's the same Python version, same Airflow version, same Python packages, 
as the Airflow environment that we run in Prod. It's just a really, it's kind of following the fail fast principle. You want people to be able to work on code really quickly and, if it, and be able to get quick feedback if it's working or not. But we have found that, I mean, I think most people would agree with this, you also want a staging environment that's running on the same or very similar, maybe not the same, but like identical infrastructure as your prod environment. Sometimes there's issues with, with Airflow that has nothing to do with the DAG code, but maybe it's the underlying infrastructure. And so all code should be tested in a stage environment that mimics the prod environment as well. Of course, this should, be, should, this should be obvious to everyone, but code in either of these local Docker environment or a staging environment shouldn't be able to modify or touch any prod systems. Only code running in the Airflow prod environment should be able to touch any kind of prod database tables or make API calls to anything like that. All right, a uh, couple more here. One is just we leave secret management to operations team. We don't want our business developers to have to worry about secrets and passing them around, and we don't do that too much on data engineering. I'm not going to go into that anymore, but happy to talk about that with people afterwards if they want. And then finally, building access control. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's just if you only let people have access to the, let's just say the airflow DAGs that their team should even have access to, it just, you're, you're just helping people not accidentally make a mistake. Basically, if you keep people siloed to stuff that they should be dealing with, you don't have to worry about them. It's someone accidentally making a mistake and you know, someone from finance messing with the DAG from someone from customer support or something like that. All right, I'll talk about how we do alerts and monitoring in a team-based setting. So we require all DAGs to use those on star callback methods. So that's like, in particular, the on success callback or the on failure callback method. All DAGs in our environment must use those. When, in, when a failure happens, when a task fails, the Airflow fires an alert for us to PagerDuty. I just wrote to an, to an integrated alert service. And then that PagerDuty sends a, a message to a team-specific Slack channel. Now, the image that I put up here doesn't really show it, but I really want to specify that we have team-specific alert Slack channels. So we have Airflow Finance Alerts channel, and we have an Airflow Data Science Alerts channel. And what's really great about that, uh, at least for how it's worked for us, is that it makes me a data engineer who is kind of keeping my eyes on a lot of Airflow DAGs. I immediately know which team I need to talk to about their DAG failing. And then in Slack, you can easily just have a back and forth conversation with perhaps, let's just say it's a finance DAG, with the finance developer who's interested in the DAG. And we can quickly diagnose, hey, is this an issue that you know, data engineering needs to, res needs to work on? Is it, perhaps it's an issue, maybe a change in SQL is needed and that would be the developer on the business team. And we just do that right in Slack. PagerDuty's been a good tool for this. I'm sure there's other services. Also, there's other, other messaging apps in Slack, and I'm sure it can work similar in all of those as well. All right, access control. So I was a little hesitant to include this slide, but I am gonna go along with it for completeness sake. So again, access control, the idea of being able to silo different teams to only touch and modify and accidentally make mistakes with stuff with their own team, I think is, is good for everyone, at least in our case. So how it looks is, we, again, we have this operations team. And when we get a new hire at Kobo, who's gonna be some sort, of, some sort of developer on a business team, they get assigned to a team. We use Active Directory, but I know there's many other services for that. Then what we do as data engineers is, you can see that bottom left image, that we, we then make use of the, the custom roles with Airflow and map one to the business team. So I think Airflow ships with five default roles. And, this, and so you can set a user to like an admin, a user, op, viewer, or public. I think those are the five default ones. But then we have custom ones for the business teams at Kobo that use Airflow. So we might have a data science role or finance role or something like that. And there's some magic that, well, I say magic, because I don't do it, but I think operations, we automatically basically map someone from whatever team they're assigning Kobo to that role in, in Airflow. Then what we do is, again, as part of the code review and linting process, is we require every single DAG we have to use the access control parameter. With the access control param, you can say, hey, who, these people can view this DAG, or these people can edit this DAG. And we require every DAG to explicitly state which teams can edit a DAG. What this effectively does is this means like a, fin a finance business developer can pause or unpause, they can clear runs, they can trigger manual DAG runs for any finance DAGs. 
but they can't do it for a data science stack. Vice versa, data scientists can do it for, for data science stacks, but not the other. So this is, in a way, a way we've kind of created silos in one Airflow environment. Yep, all right, moving on. So, I keep mentioning this operations team, and I just want to mention how they have different, re I want to go into, I should say, how they have different responsibilities than us in the data engineering team. So operations, they are the ones responsible for setting up our self-hosted infrastructure. They deal with secret management. They don't know Airflow. Again, they, they don't know Airflow as the application, or they know it is an application that us data engineers do, but they don't know anything more about it than that. And they grant different users at the company, different employees, access to even being able to get to, for example, the Airflow web UI of our Airflow prod or Airflow stage environments. Us on data engineering, we have some infrastructure knowledge, but not a ton. We often re rely on operations for help with that. Again, this might be really different at your org if you're using a managed service. Perhaps that these kind of the infrastructure knowledge is less applicable, but it is for us at Kobo. For we as data engineers do handle Airflow deployments. So we upgrade versions of Airflow. We upgrade versions of Python in Airflow. We make package changes to the various Python packages we're installing in it. That's all my team. Again, we have general knowledge of kind of all the DAGs on Airflow, and we do do code reviews to get them all there. But as I've said a couple times, we're not experts in the business logic. That's where we have a conversation with the different business developers. And then finally, we're experts in best practices. Experts, I'll put that in quotes. We're, we're the in-house experts in terms of things like resource usage, scheduling, configuration, executors, that kind of thing. All right, we're into my summary slide. So here's what I would suggest, or suggest how it works well for us, is that you know having a team that knows Airflow inside and out, your org has spent a lot of time, they get excited when an, a new Airflow re release drops, they read the Airflow re release notes, for us, that's the data engineering team. This team supports the business teams, as I've just been outlining. However, they don't generally write Airflow DAGs and handle all DAG failures or task failures when they happen. Instead, it's again, it's a, it's a, a collaborative effort to figure out who needs to own a task failure. Let's see, I would suggest investing in ways to make it simpler for the non-power users to jump into Airflow. I detailed that a little bit earlier, a few things we do. And again, I know the access control slide may have been a bit confusing. I think you can do to automate team assignment within your org to basically map someone on what team they're on to which DAGs they should have permissions on in Airflow is, is, can be really useful. And finally, just removing complexities from the business developers so that they can get what they need to get done for the business is great and they should lean on the data engineers or the Airflow experts in their org to help them out in that sense. All right, taking it farther, there's definitely full acknowledge there's probably a lot of things that we could do to, to get better at, to make Airflow better, better experience for everyone in my company, but a few that come to mind is, I've looked at this a few times, but not enough time really jumping into it, to explore using YAML files to abstract away even more Airflow details from developers, or really this might be abstracting away having to write Python. So for example, Astronomer has a DAG factory package where you basically can write DAGs using writing in YAML instead of Python. And that's something that I'd be interested in exploring more. And then again, the thing I keep saying I'm not gonna talk about, but apparently I'm talking about a lot, is multi-tenancy. As, again, I'm hearing rumors that there's gonna be some, a lot more support, like first class support for that coming around the corner soon. And considering we have multiple teams using Airflow, it's something I'll be very excited to look at as more options around that come out. Sure, there's more stuff to look at too that we could do, but I don't have anything listed on the slide. And with that, I'm gonna wrap it up.